Well, thank you all. This is, of course, one in a series of our Hot Topics lectures over the course of the summer in which we have our various faculty, and in this case, visiting scholars, um, join us for conversations about areas where they are working. And I, I should make a note that our Visiting Scholars program, which is um, so effectively illustrated by these two gentlemen, um, is intended to bring people here who care about ideas. This is, you know, part of the joy of being at a law school and a law school community is that ideas matter. And so these, these guys have been given the permission and encouragement to think and to, to, to use that in, in their writing and their, their own work. And in this case, we get to a little sampling of some of what, of what their ideas are. And so let me introduce this team, which I, I was trying to think of a superhero you know, combination. And Batman and Robin just doesn't seem to fit. So maybe, uh, maybe Butch, you know, fight over which is right. Butch Dance and the Sundance Kid, or which, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Would, would that work? Yeah. Right. Comedy, All you know, <laughs> serious. All right, I, I'm, I won't go any deeper with that. Um, but so for, let me introduce Jonathan first. So Jonathan Rosenblum um, teaches at Drake. He's the head of the Environment and Sustainability Program there. Um, he's uh, written uh, uh, on many, many different topics, but his uh, couple of his textbooks, Resilience and Sustainability from Theory to Practice, um, Land Use and Sustainable Development Law. Um, and I should note, both for the students in particular, you know, there's this myth that there is a career ladder and that you start here and then you end there. And both of these gentlemen are examples of the fact that really um, good lawyers, um, good advocates, good law professors all have a well-rounded background experience. And both of these gentlemen have had a wide ranging set of experiences. Um, for instance, Jonathan um, has also worked for the federal government. He's worked uh, for a nonprofit urban research institute. And he's worked for Reed Smith, a private law firm. Um, He's clerked at the 11th Circuit and um, has founded a nonprofit uh, related to local and state governments. So, um, so welcome, welcome, Jonathan. Um, and uh, Keith Hirakawa, close? That's great. The, the, uh, That's great. Um, is the uh, is associate professor at Albany Law School. Um, he teaches in the environmental natural resources, land use planning, property law arena. Um, he's done uh, a couple of examples of his writing, a book on greening local government, legal strategies for promoting sustainability, um, environmental law and contrasting ideas of nature, a constructivist approach, uh, rethinking sustainable development. So you can see some overlap between the intellectual um, interests of these folks. Um, Keith has also been uh, a teacher at Texas Wesleyan, um, now Texas A&M, and has also taught at University of Oregon and did some work in Washington State and uh, and Oregon, I think, also in private practice. So please join me in welcoming um, Keith and Jonathan. Thanks. Thank you, David, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Keith, it is truly an honor and a pleasure for us to be here today. Um, and a special thanks to Vermont Law School, to the dean, to Courtney, uh, and to David, and to Melissa Scanlon. Uh, it, one of the things, Keith and I have been working together for about five years. However, we're about 1,200 miles apart. And so this has really been an amazing opportunity for us to, to sit down over the last several days and into next week to get an enormous amount of work done in a short amount of time. Um, and so we're very grateful for it. So thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Keith, who's going to give us a general overview of the topic, and then we're going to dive into it. Thank you, John. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> So um, one of the things that's kind of cool here is that we get to do this together. And we're trying to figure out um, you know, how to engage everybody in the ideas that we think are really important. Uh, and John's the creative one, so he wanted to have a scavenger hunt, uh, which totally didn't work. And then we had this thing where we were going to do secret messages. We figured that would be kind of a weird one, too. <laughs> but so what we decided to do is, uh, is we figured we'd engage you in the way we talk a little bit. Um, as you can notice, Right, one person gets to be the hero. We put these up here. And, and the other one, which used to be villain, and then for some reason that changed to the other guy. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, we're a little more like-minded than the dialogue goes, but we, uh, we thought we'd try this out, right, and see what happened about sort of how these ideas develop. And what we wanted you to see is, you know, we're trying to sort of capture the last five years of our collaboration, and so we're trying to sort of make this an evolutionary dialogue and see if we can bring you along, and you can see how we uh, how we think about it. Um, and, and of course, to be fair, 
we're going to switch back and forth on who gets to be the hero from time to time. So don't pay attention to who's talking, but where the <laughs> talk is coming from. And that way, it'll be a little easier to follow. And if you don't follow that, you're, you're stuck in <laughs> any idea what's going on. And maybe that's fine, too, because you know, we're really just sort of trying something out. We don't know how it's going to work at all. Um, but what we're going to talk about today, again, it's something we've been working on. Is we've had this focus on uh, what happens small, what happens local. Right? And because we've always had this sense that the way we uh, confront our contextual, our environmental issues is just so different locally uh, that we need to figure out how to capture that so we can understand you know, a little bit how to manipulate, but really how to take advantage of it. So why local government needs to think locally. So that's what we're talking about today. And as we were working through this, we discovered we think some pretty cool things uh, because what we identified uh, as important locally, or what we should think of as important locally, uh, challenges a lot of the models that we have used to uh, create federal environmental law. And so we're going to get into that uh, a little bit today. Um, and you know, again, so this is new. We're trying it out a little bit. So some of the points will come quickly. Some of them will take a long time. So make sure that we hammer them home and you don't <laughs> miss them. Um, but you know, if something's going on weird and you want us to shut up, or if you just have a question, you know, let's get into it, right? Because the dialogue again, we're sort of we're not wed to it, uh, but we want to know what you think, right? Um, and in large part, we want to know what you think because we think that this is going to be where our scholarship is going to be focusing, you know, for the next five years or so. Um, and so this is really for us a really good opportunity uh, to see if we're doing what we think we're doing, right? Uh, so by all means, let's engage if you feel up to it. If you don't, we're just going to assume you totally buy. Everything we say, and you're ready to buy the book, right? Um, so thank you for coming, uh, and we hope it's interesting to you. All right, great. Let's get started. So in the first place, uh, Keith, please remember that we have a federal environmental law program. Do you really think that we and locals can add anything here? I do. And I think the place to start is identifying what the federal program can not accomplish. Now the question is, what values are important for environmental protection that aren't accounted for in the federal program? Oh, that's a good question. But in answering it, keep in mind the breadth of the federal regulatory scheme. There are many substantive areas covered by the federal government law. Help yourself to a biology book, for example. Cut to any page, almost any subject in there is covered on the federal regulatory scheme from species to habitat to coastal protection to historic preservation and cultural as well. And you think it does a good job? Well, we're, hang on now, I didn't say that. <laughs> we can always tinker around the edges, though, in the sense that we can implement different regulations, we can increase levels. But if you want to start the conversation with the missing link, the federal government will be a tough nut to crack as it covers so many topics. So what's missing? OK. Well, let's consider as a starting point uh, this. Why doesn't the Forest Service regulate urban trees in the same way they do uh, their national forest management planning process? Well, probably because most urban trees grow on municipal or private property. Sure. But the Forest Service is the nation's authority on tree management and forest health. Why omit urban trees altogether? But if we lose a substantial portion of our urban forests uh, to a bug or disease or development, that loss doesn't show up in any of the planning processes. Yeah, of course it doesn't, right? Because tree loss from something like development is probably going to be pretty benign from the Forest Service standpoint. What impact would the loss of a tree or two really have at this kind of national scale? Yeah, that's right, exactly. Right? It doesn't matter at that scale to the Forest Service, but it does matter. It matters locally. Right? Every kid who loses a tree to climb on, every house that loses shade, Every street that suffers more storm water, kids don't have leaves anymore to jump in. We feel these losses very acutely in a local way. Maybe. And let's say I subscribe to that, but that's not really environmental law. It sure it is. Well, there's a good reason federal environmental law ignores hypersensitivity or the specificity, right? Or NIMBY, especially whiny people like my colleague. Uh, because the, because the federal model, among other things, sets a nationwide minimum standard for human and health. It identifies what's safe and acts accordingly. Why do we care about someone's very special community needs 
or their local attachments to their neighborhood, especially when they only want to protect what's theirs, often at the expense of others. Why should we care about this or even condone it? Well, we should care because it matters to some person or some community in a very unique way, right? Every property is unique, every home is unique, every drop, every speck, every community uh, is unique, and it is exactly in a place that no other thing shares. Right? And how those things influence a community's identity is important, and it's taken into account at the local level, uh, which is exactly what we're talking about today. OK, so yes, everything is unique. But I still have no idea why individualizing environmental law, creating a different standard of environmental quality for every person, for every property, and particularly relevant here, every community, is workable or conceivable or even desirable. Why would we want to replace uniform standards for human health with something so arbitrary and fractionalized? Well, I'm not sure we need to replace the current system. And I'm not sure we'd want to displace human health standards. But I'm proposing that we consider the benefits of thinking small about environmental law. Right? I'm proposing that environmental law might benefit from identifying environmental values by considering where those values arise, right? how environment is valued locally. Finally. Jeez, that was exhausting. <laughs> That's right. OK, just in case you didn't notice, we just switched. <laughs> OK, so what that means, right? remember, what you're looking at is these things. Right? Hero, other guy. OK, so you must explain to me, uh, what is so important about small and unique? Well, OK, I didn't mean small. I meant here. There's something important about being able to say here, it's the relevance of place that's not accounted for in federal environmental law. Yeah, you lost me. All right, I'm talking about the relevance of place. As geographer Tuan stated, place is a special kind of object. He says that place is not a valued thing that can be handled. Instead, he says, it's a space in which we might dwell. Well, like a, like a home? Yeah, it could be a home. It could be home, but you could think of it also more conceptually. Humans are situated, right? We're situated. We're always engaged in a situated space, places where space becomes special. It's where we're engaged, where we experience significant identity events. So it could be like a home, and it could be other many spaces and place people in context. OK, so the person is where we find them. Sort of. What we see when we see others is all the things that they are. When we look at a person, we see the person in context, meaning a person in place. The person taken together with the person's environment, the person's cradle to grave, their influences, and how the person identifies as self as a result of those experiences. OK. So the home is the context. It's not a thing. We, we see the person in home because the character of the home influences the person in many ways. Ways that you can see even when the person is somewhere else, right? The person takes those influences on the road. Yes, they do. And those influences can be many, and they can be varied. OK, so I'm with you. You're saying that the place where we live or go to school, picnic in a particular pasture, swim in a particular creek, but I still don't see what's so special about home or place or whatever. I can see that these spaces are in the world and that these events make them into place. I think you can see more. Isn't there more about space, though? Well, maybe there's something special, at least about place. right? Memories, perceptions, they're going to be situated contextually. Although all those experiences are situated, all the situations are also place-based. Ecology is the context. Right? which means that people are ecologically situated. I feel very strongly that I can say, I am ecologically situated. OK. So being ecologically situated means that environment is the place where we experience. We experience our lives, our jobs. And I suppose it's because we experience in a situated way that we make particular choices relative to our surroundings. Indeed. And it comes from being ecologically situated. We seek out ecological knowledge because that helps us understand ourselves. We switched again. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
What types of knowledge are you talking about here? <clears throat> okay. The types of knowledge that come from experience. Right? They arise based on observations and interactions. This is what we might think of as engaged knowledge. It means having access uh, to the knowledge we get from a particular experience. And we're going to refer to this, or at least I refer to this, as the insider's experience. Now, I'm not much of an artist, right? But I'm going to draw something for you, and it's very complicated, so pay attention. Okay. And see if you can follow. I got this one because of its difficulty in getting the lines straight. What, what is that? John, John, this is what we call the vertical horizontal illusion. Because you, you understand that it looks like an upside down T. So this isn't part of the presentation. Just give me a hard <laughs> no, time. Is, yes, it does look like an upside down uh, T, but, but, it, but it, it's important. right? So what's going on here is a very simple depiction. Uh, of something we may confront, but what we have to realize is we fill in the meaning of this somehow. And in all likelihood, we fill it in uh, with something that means something to us. So according to the vertical horizontal illusion, uh, somebody who's an urban dweller may see particular things in these lines, very immediacy-oriented lines, a corner of a building, the edge of the sidewalk, things that we confront on a regular basis that means something, probably something with danger, something that makes us have to interact. If I put my foot off that sidewalk into the street, I might get hit by a car. Right? These are the things we confront ourselves in the urban environment. And if I'm an urbanite, I probably will see something like that at first glance. In contrast, somebody who's a rural resident may see these lines into the horizon. They're longer lines. There's less symmetry. We go into the horizon. The immediacy of the danger happens at a different pace and a different scale. And those are the things I will fill the blanks in with because of my perception bias. OK, yeah, so you're just talking about perception. Then. That's right. Um, perception. Note how different right? what we're talking about here, about how we fill in the meaning of these lines, uh, how different this perception will be from an outsider's view. Well, well how so? Well, the insider's view is going to concern uh, those places and those meanings that come out of experience, right? This is why it's meaningful to talk about our place, right? Our pasture, our views, our walk to work, right? These are, this is experienced knowledge. Okay, so the difference is that we do not experience federal places like an unvisited national park or even federal governance of those places. Yeah, that's right. There's no federal counterpart to this type of knowledge, right? So back to geographer Tuan states, the modern nation is a large bounded space. It's difficult to experience in any direct or meaningful way. And so patriotism is a special kind of knowledge. It's something conceptual, uh, but not something experienced or engaged. Right? We may rally around a flag or sing, sing the same song, but not because we're experiencing what's behind that symbol. Right? It's something we won't have an actual relationship to. OK, but can't we just visit a national park, special places designated under Antiquities Acts, and, and get the same type of knowledge? Well, we can experience the space, but the values and the reasons for regulating those spaces originate over too great and expansive space. So that's why Tuan states that a sense of place rings false when it is claimed over large territory, because affection cannot be stretched over an empire. Right, Tuan's telling us that we associate differently with place based on size. So see if you can identify the source of these statements I'll give you. Wait, you uh, give me a test? This is a it's test, a test. but it's more like okay. an experiment. <laughs> is that, I'm not sure that's better. <laughs> yeah, you're being experiment. graded on this. That's right. Right. this will, I think this is going to illustrate the difference oh. uh, between an insider and outsider perspective, the way we're talking about it. OK, so the first one is. We are a destination community for innovation, education, commerce, and living a place where you belong. OK, this sounds local to me. It sounds like a statement you might find by a resort town or sure. an upper middle class town. No, I think that's right. Now, how about this? Our community residents share a sense of place and take great pride in their established and emerging neighborhoods. That also sounds local. The reference to neighborhoods kind of gives it away. 
the reference to pride also seems very intimate and local. I agree. How about this? The intention of this act is to declare a policy which will encourage productive and enjoyable harmony between man and his environment. OK, that one sounds sexist. Uh, <laughs> but then between local, oh, uh, that's a tough one. I, I want it to be local because I like the idea of harmony. OK, sure. But where is that harmony going to take place? Like, there is no here. There is no place to which this statement must apply. The idea can be applied at 20,000 feet to anyone across communities in any region, state, or nation. Right? The thing is, the goal of that last statement is not to land the principle of harmony in any particular place. The statement separates man or humans uh, from his environment, and it clearly distinguishes the two. It separates them, but it's also asking for harmony. Right? It's trying to create harmony within man's environment. OK, sure. But let's compare those local statements with the last one, which, by the way, comes from NEPA. You all know what NEPA is? Some of you? Okay. National Environmental Policy. In NEPA, environment is the object. It's the other thing. Right? There is man, and then there is environment. And there's a divide between the two. Environment is the thing that has to be identified so that it can be fixed. Right? That is environment in the federal scheme. The object. In contrast, the local statements talk about we and our place. They evidence a sense of pride and embeddedness. right? Not because the environment is worthy, uh, but because my environment is worthy. This isn't a mistake. right? It's not random. We emerges from a sense of community and place as it pertains to people, ecology, uh, industry, or whatever. right? And it means something different when it comes from the federal government. OK, so we looked at these local and, and these local uh, plans. And then we looked at NEPA. And they use different language. But aren't they just talking about the same thing? Right. Well, maybe those words uh, don't matter in every instance. But think about how it's applied on the ground. Right? And, and one example is the Louisville Loop. Right? The city of Louisville has planned this 100-mile path, a city trail, that's going to encircle the city and link parks and neighborhoods, provide alternative transportation, uh, maybe enhance the environment. Uh, they're building this right now, 100 mile loop around the city. OK, so Louisville Loop, it's a paved path. Maybe it's a cool path. Maybe it's a long path. But at the end of the day, it's still just a path. That's right. From the outsider's view, it's a path, right? Objectively speaking, it might reduce some congestion. It might offer some recreation. It's got pavement like any other path. But the insider's perspective reveals very different values that might accrue within this loop. But it's still the same path, right? I mean, it's still physically the same concrete slab. That's right. Physically and objectively speaking, it's still that same path. But to people in the community, it means something different. For people within Louisville who are inside or close to the path, they, can't, they can no longer think of themselves and their place without knowing that the loop is there. Right? So when they were planning this loop, uh, the mayor, Greg Fisher, said, it's going to set us apart. It's going to make it desirable. It's going to connect people. Right? The mayor thought of this as the wedding ring of the city, redefining and describing their self to take into account who we are with the path. OK. All right. So but if you're talking about scope and issue and size and matters, right, it's really coming down to experience, right? And can't I visit your path and your tree and, and have a very similar or special experience? You can. You can visit it. But that's still a different kind of experience. When you visit my special place, you have an outsider's perspective. So Tuan states, the visitor's evaluation of environment is essentially aesthetic. Right? It's an outsider's view. The outsider judges by appearance, by some formal canon of beauty. That's not the same as being engaged in an ecosystem. OK, so let's step back for a moment. Let's see if I understand. So a sense of place depends on personal experiences. And it's ecological context. It's ecologically situated. This gets back now to the beginning. So tell me why this matters to environmental law. OK, well, this is definitely a point you need to understand to grasp the concept of insider environmental law. Why? Well, 
Consider Euclid, the decision of Euclid. Do we know Euclid? Some of us? Maybe uh, give, a, give a little. Sure. What's Euclid? So what's, Euclid was a fantastic. What's Euclid? <laughs> what's that? I was looking. I couldn't remember if we had, at one point, at one point we had villain, but also at one point didn't we have like the less smart guy or something? But anyways, <laughs> uh, right. yeah, what's, what's Euclid? Uh, <laughs> um, so Euclid went to the Supreme Court in 1926 and was the first time the Supreme Court had an opportunity to think about how local governments regulate land use. In that particular case, that was the Supreme Court's um, acceptance of the concept of zoning. And what was going on at the time was Cleveland was booming and it had a rail line that went from Cleveland right to the village of Euclid. And industrial development was following that rail line straight into Euclid. And before that, Euclid didn't really have any control. They had a market, right? And so people would buy low and build stuff. And, 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 and everybody had ideas, especially because they had this fantastic resource of a rail line. Um, so the village folks got together and decided what they didn't want to become was another village that was taken over by industry because it was served by a rail line. And they developed a scheme of regulations that allowed particular kinds of land uses, and to be honest with you, put it smack dab in the way of that industrial development to make sure it couldn't get to the village. Okay? So what the, and, and what the Supreme Court said with that is they approved it as within the scope of local government's powers, the police power, to protect health, safety, and welfare. Okay. Now, what? Uh, is there more? There will be, but not right now. <laughs> but I'm, I'm with you so far. Euclid sounds like a good case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for our purposes also, what happened with that is the court deferred to this community's land use scheme and expressly refused to second guess these particular choices. Because what was going on here that the court was essentially approving of and delegating authority to? Uh, was the choice of what kind of community the village of Euclid wanted to be. Right? Was the choice of the values that they were using law to protect. This is local environmental law. Wait, wait, wait. That, that can't be right. Euclid is not an environmental law case. Right? For example, it's not in any environmental law textbook, as far as I know. But it's in every land use textbook. Including his book. What? There you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but it very much is an environmental law case. Right? It concerns the residents of Euclid. Right? The analysis is about community self-knowledge. That right? is, it underlies Euclid, the village's sense of place. The villages were protecting their values against change. And this is place-based challenge. It's not limited to what we might call environmental law from a federal perspective. But didn't Euclid involve a whole host of non-environmental issues? The village engineers were concerned about sewer. They were concerned about road capacity. Pretty significant gray infrastructure kind of stuff. This is the kind of stuff that, deal, that cities deal with all the time, not environmental law. Yeah, but from the perspective of sense of place, these issues are sufficiently relevant. So think about the First Circuit's decision in Steel Mill, in which the court considered the authority of the community to limit the construction and integration of hundreds of new homes, this is a quote, which would have an irreversible effect on the area's ecological balance. It would destroy scenic values, decrease open space, significantly change the rural character of the small town pose substantial financial burdens on the town for police, fire, sewer, and road service, and open the way for the tides of weekend visitors who would own second homes. This is sense of place. The breadth of the local issues, the ecological balance and scenic values, rural character, efficiency of governance at the local level, these all fit into exactly what local governments uh, do when they're looking at their sense of place. The fear of the loss of any of these advantages goes to the community's deeply felt interests. All right, this is very interesting, but, but you're going to have to break this down for, a little, um, for me a little bit, especially the steel mill quote. It's a big quote here. So distinguish in steel mill between the environmental issues and the built environmental issues. Well, that's the point. You really can't. The court's recognizing that there may not be a line 
between community and environment. Right? This diverse uh, array of interests that make up the community are all relevant to this analysis. In essence, community and environment, from the sense of place perspective, are coextensive. So the court's treating both the environment and uh, the built environment or the, the human issues as one? Yeah, that's right. And this is the critical lesson. Right? It recognizes the importance of sense of place from an insider's perspective. It embodies an identity process in which communities do not further their sense of place by studying about it in a book or looking at somebody else's pictures. Right? Sense of place is not objectification. Sense of place is involvement. It's a perspective that requires an insider's viewpoint. Right? So consider some more of these local visionary type statements that we find in planning documents. Right? This county is a community widely recognized for high quality of life and sense of our tradition. Our children have inherited a livable, vibrant, and economically diverse community. Every one of our neighborhoods is a, is a safe place. OK, I've never read this kind of language with our, our, and our in any kind of federal regulation of natural resources. So they're using language to indicate the situationness. We switched again. <laughs> Just need to make sure that's clear. OK. So sense of place focuses on situatedness, uniqueness, competitive advantage, and the like in a way that's not really represented in the federal scheme. So you said. Remember, I'm this guy now. But sense of place then gets us back to where we started. Right? It empowers local governments to be protective socially, environmentally, especially economically. Right? Sense of place probably justifies the need for uniformity across the region. OK, I understand why you might think that, as the typical framing and justification for uniformity in federal action is more or less that. But before you condemn the concept of sense of place, consider how far this idea diverges from federalism framing. How many local governments can be considered environmental actors for purposes of this competition you're thinking of? Right. So we probably could identify 25,000 relevant local governments as actors that independently utilize resources. And each one of these is in competition for resources both among one another and also in the hierarchy, a hierarchical system. OK, well, go further. Though. Why under this view are they considered to be in competition? Because of the scarcity of resources, right? The resources have value. And local governments c compete to secure those resources and provide an advantage for the residents. Wait, why, why are they competing again? Um, I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> ah, to make sure that they gain the benefits for their citizens before other communities consume them and they're gone. OK, but, but how so? Well, under the classic tragedy of the commons, the theory is something like, Local governments are caught in competition over any resource that is depletable. Right? Each local government seeks to maximize its self-interest by consuming or using before others do, or else they'll lose it. OK, take it one step further now, though. How could an insider view of environmental law exacerbate the tragedy? Right. Under well, your view. <laughs> under my view. Yeah, yeah your insider. view. <laughs> an insider view of environmental law recognizes a different way to talk about the community's relationship with their ecology. Right? That way involves appreciating the influence ecology has on community. In so doing, we're just identifying a community's self-interest. Right? That self-interest is a basis for consumption. That's a good description. However, what you've done is you put the sense of place in the federal framing. That analysis inserts the sense of place right into the existing framework that we consider for federal law. But sense of place is not just an application of local priorities to existing federal law. Federal law is an outsider perspective. It's a different perspective altogether. Right? And so because of that, federal law may not be able to accommodate the values that are essential for a sense of place. Well, how do those values differ? Well, the framing of the tragedy under neoclassical law and economics assumes three very important things. And we'll try to walk through them. So stay with me here. All right? All right. Each of these three builds on a perspective 
that excludes a sense of place, As right? This should. is foundational. As it should. Right? That's the way we're going to ensure uniformity and value neutrality. Well, maybe. Maybe. But let's look at the basics first. First, the tragedy defines resources in terms of equivalent units. Yes, it does. Right? In the classic tragedy story, uh, we begin with so many or other units of a resource. The resource is measurable. It's definable. So what resource should we start with? OK, this would be a good example, all right? But, but does it even matter? Of course it matters. But what we, why, why does it matter what resource we well, use? Because we view trees as differently than any other resource, such as a pasture or whatever. Not for purposes of the tragedy. Earlier, when you described the tragedy, you meant to mention that it could be used or it could be any depletable resource. The tragedy assumes that we're going to treat any usable, depletable resource in a certain and similar way. But not only that, but each part of the resource is considered equivalent. It's considered the same. OK, so walk through a forest and tell me what I see. OK, so if you're walking through a forest under the tragedy, you could see one of two things, right? From a tragedy perspective first, rather, you could see something like five units over here. And look at how beautiful these three units up on the ridge are. And then down over there by the lake are another 15 units. Yeah, I don't talk like that. Yeah, but maybe, but for the tragedy, you would. Right? The tragedy views the forest as equivalent units. Even though each tree may have a different history, we have intentionally shaved all of that off under the tragedy. They're viewed as neutral. Does this apply to all trees? Yes. But what about the tree that has a tire swing from which you fell when you were 10? What about the giving tree? And what about all sorts of other trees? For purposes of a commons analysis, those differences simply don't matter. I kind of think they should matter. OK, but now you're getting to a sense of place. Look, we're not just talking about the uniqueness of individual trees. But each tree is ecologically situated, among other trees. Just like each community is ecologically situated or situated around other neighborhoods. Right? So a sense of place for a community places it among other communities. And that's the other way to view sense or the, your walk through the forest. OK. Well, if I have to choose one of these views, let's just neutralize the other values. A tree's a tree. Once you've seen one, you've seen them all. OK. So yes, that's the tragedy story. Because I know what a tree is, I can count how many trees I need to build in order to cut down trees for a garage or a bridge. From this perspective, resources get their value from being consumable. Right. Right. We need uniformity because each rational actor is encouraged to consume or deplete the resource or risk losing it to someone else. OK, if you walk through a forest, maybe you would talk about units for purposes of consumption because you were concerned with logging, for example. But is consuming or depleting a forest the only relationship we have with a forest? What do you mean? Well, do you like to hike? Do you like to bird watch, picnic? I do. In fact, such uses are very important ways in which individuals and communities experience and interact with their local environments. Agreed. And these experiences and values associated with them make up in large part the sense of place that we attribute to being embedded in the environment. Moreover, such values are not accounted for in the tragedy analysis. The tragedy views the forest in a way that neutralizes the other values and it objectifies the forest as something to be consumed. So assuming consumption does what? The consumption-based story assumes all communities have a similar relationship with the forest. And it assumes that a tree is a tree, and we treat them all the same. OK, no, I get it. I get it. Uh, and in so doing, it doesn't account for these other values. That means the tragedy view forecloses us from considering the dynamics of it. Right, and it also highlights the third framing point, that the consumption-based story prevents us from self-aware conception of the injury suffered by the depletion of natural resources. Well, why isn't the injury sufficiently recognized in the consumption-based valuation of law? Before you mentioned hiking, picnicking, proposing to a loved one under a tree, for example, do these things have value? Sure. Certainly. You can see that those activities have no value, though, in the tragedy story. Values that may arise from outside of the tragedy story, such as the ways in which the environment is relevant to a sense of self, do not seem to play any role. Yet the injury to sense of self is profoundly deeper 
than that experienced in the tragedy of the commons. Loss of a resource and loss of a self are not the same thing. OK, show me. Sure. For starters, we need to agree that to account for the loss of a census place as an alternative to commodification of values, we're going to have to change how we measure resource injury. All right, at this point, we've discovered, we've discovered that a perspective gained from experiencing places is different than unexperienced places. Because a sense of place is embedded in knowledge, it probably addresses values that we don't find in more objectifying approach, such as the separation of humans from nature found in federal environmental law. We also laid out the way that local law accommodates a sense of place and arguably expands to include the considerations that are relevant to an insider's environmental law view. But you have yet to explain to me why local governments would do a good job of regulating in this way to maximize the benefits of a sense of place. Yeah, that's right. Let's turn to that question. Where would you like to start? Maybe the best place to start is why this perspective should be the driver in environmental law at all. OK. Well, but first we have to make sure we don't prematurely turn to sense of place as a normative principle. Right? Sense of place isn't a trump card, even though it's important. It's just what local governments do. Uh, no. That's <laughs> not what they do? Uh, sorry, even though it's very important. Yeah. Oh, yes, no. <laughs> uh, off of scripts, it happens. Well, so sense of place and the personal attachments that drive value, right? they're just not normative. It's a different kind of knowledge. OK, but then that really leaves open the question, why would local governments regulate in a way that we want them to? Well, I think here we have to turn to ecosystem services, ecological economics of place. Yeah, I know all about ecosystem services. I've read all your great articles there, Mr. Hirokawa. Uh, the study of ecosystem services. You guys all saw that pitch, right? <laughs> just plugging away here. The study of ecosystem services attempts to reframe our understanding of how we value nature. Ecosystem services focuses on ecosystem functionality to show the measurable benefits that people receive from ecosystems. That is, this approach allows us to attribute economic value to leaving ecosystems alone, to letting them function. Yeah, that's right. right? So in, according to, or in, in, according, in addition to producing valuable goods, bananas, trees for lumber and some such things, ecosystems provide these services that are vital to human life and well-being, both to individuals and communities. OK, but I don't see how this is relevant to a sense of place argument. Why not? Well, take wetlands. The ecosystem services approach might focus on how functioning wetlands provides a valuable service of filtering contaminants out of water. So it filters the water and provides a service to us. If the wetlands are disturbed, however, we'll have to build a new water filtration plant. Exactly. But we don't see it that way, not normatively nor descriptively. If wetlands are so valuable, meaning they're equivalent to a water filtration plant, why don't they fetch top dollar on the market? Right. So it's taking time for ecosystem service values to translate into the market, but that's not the case for environmental governance. Right? Consider how value of leaving functioning ecosystems in place works. When we value environment only as commodity for what we can cut or sell or build, we don't see, right? We ignore the services that are provided by healthy ecosystems, and we don't grasp the loss that's suffered by displacement of that ecosystem. In your wetlands example, either nature filters the water or we build a filtration plant. That's a cost that local governments and their communities will have to bear, right? So the more we account for ecosystem services, the more we see the risk of squandering these services through unreflective consumption. But that doesn't answer the question. Will or can local governments do this? Sure, right? So let's look at an example, right? Louisville, once again, Louisville is sort of our place, apparently. Um, a couple years ago, Louisville commissioned a study of the urban forest. And under the assessment, uh, they found that the urban forest is both a challenge uh, and a strategy. At the time, Louisville was losing an approximately 54,000 trees on an annual basis. And what started as approximately a 40% canopy cover 
uh, where trees are doing a lot of work at 40 percent, the prediction was they were going to go down to 20 percent uh, sometime in the next 40 years. Um, and the important point that Louisville took out of this was that that loss of trees, that loss of canopy cover, translated very directly into dollars and cents. When the study was done, the estimate was that the urban forest, on an annual basis, saved the city about $330 million by way of stormwater capture, uh, energy savings from shade, uh, safety, security, aesthetics, all the things that urban forests do. And that didn't even account for lifetime carbon capture and other very significant uh, financial advantages. Right? The governance decision coming out of this analysis is maintain and even expand the urban forest means more money for the city of Louisville. Right? Maintain the forest right? and uh, services provided translates directly into money, which is a governance decision. Okay, that, that's a huge amount of money you're talking about, but so what? So Louisville has decided to think about functional forest as an asset, not for a commodity such as timber, but for the services that are provided. The value of leaving the trees in place and allowing them to work. But can local governments collect on these assets? Well, the, the point that comes out of this is that thinking about functioning ecosystems as assets uh, will change how we interact with them and what they mean to our place. Yes, it is. OK, so that's the end of our dialogue. Um, yes. And so we're going to sum up, especially since we're getting a little late on time. Um, and so what we were trying to do today was sort of have this evolutionary dialogue to show how the different things played in with one another um, so that you could see why it is we think sense of place is starting to answer some very difficult questions. One's that maybe we haven't asked because the framing was all different, right? Because these questions we ask at the national to federal level, they don't have meaning locally, right? And this is sort of one of the things we're trying to get at. So to get to this, we started at this idea of trying to figure out what place means, right? When we are embedded, when we're engaged, our experience and knowledge, does that have anything to do? And we think it does, right? Because it's something that we don't do at a different level. And so then we talked a little bit about governance. Uh, to talk about how, at least from a constitutional standpoint, from Euclid on, what we get is that local governments actually are empowered to do what we're talking about as sense of place regulation, as environmental law, from this local perspective. And then the third question we asked was a, a complicated one, and we probably gave a little short shrift to it, but why would local governments do this kind of sense of place? Not just to protect themselves, but when we start thinking about what dollars and cents mean locally, Right? We realize that, that communities are the direct beneficiaries of the way ecosystems work. And once we start accounting for that, we've got a good governmental incentive uh, to, to act. So what we think is going on here is I think we can get a couple conclusions out of that. And then maybe we can have a conversation. Although, again, you look very convinced right now. <laughs> so maybe we could just break, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but we come to a couple conclusions out of that. The first one is um, that. You know, the way communities interact, this sort of basis, this foundation sense of place, really does equip uh, communities to face a lot of the challenges that we don't really think of them uh, as important actors in. Right? And this isn't better than the federal government or worse, but it's definitely different. Right? And that's something we have to uh, account for. And the, the counterpart to that is, if sense of place injuries is what we're feeling, we probably won't look to the federal government for solutions, right? Because the governance capacity isn't really there to act uh, according to how we see our injury, which is why we coined these phrases like NIMBY. Um, the third thing is that um, if we take seriously what lo local governments do and what's involved in sense of place, uh, we might realize that the way communities prioritize um, does focus on local governments as beneficiaries of the way we might do this governance. And again, that's not something that we really have paid a lot of attention to, and we think that we might be able to build on that. Anything to add? No. Just thank you for, for indulging us. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah. It's great. Thank you. Oh, I, I found. If you want to take a picture of this before I erase it, you might even get an original. <laughs> oh, I draw it. I think the appropriate pair is uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. That's where <laughs> I'm going now. So, 
Um, any questions or comments? So, I, so I'm, I thought it was fascinating. And I, I've always thought that a sense of place is something that's been missing in environmental law. Not that we haven't had a sense of place. If, if you've ever been to a planning and zoning meeting, you know how people feel about their sense of place. That and we talked about PTA meetings are where people feel it's OK to insult their closest friend because it's about their sense of place. But where do you then go with this, uh, having recognized it? What, what's, is this a recognition of an existing reality, and that's part of what we need to move things along, or is there a greater role for state and local government? You want to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Right. Oh, all right. Well, who, well, who are you writing? Yeah, right. Um, so where we could go from here is a variety of different places, right? The first thing we want to do, which was really the project here, was just to recognize it and to understand its difference in the federal system from the, how we approach these in the federal system. The question then, though, is do you do something at, are you looking at the federal level? Are you looking at the state level? Are you looking at the local level? Are you looking at levels that don't exist right now? We were talking earlier with David about watershed managements and are you starting to look at more ecologically based kind of management? So there's a variety of ways and places to go with it. But the first project really, as we said, was to get this down and try to put our hands around what exactly are we talking about and how is that different than how we regulate at the federal level? Well, that's right. I mean, this is a framing exercise, right? So it's trying to capture the underlying premise of why we might do it at all, right? Um, and, but what we think is if, what, if, if the sense of place has wheels, right, where would it go? And the important thing to recognize is, um, and, and there was some of this in the dialogue, is not to take that sense of place and apply success or failure of that kind of regulation based on some other perspective. So you can't take a tragedy perspective and say sense of place will never work because you're right. right? So what we have to think about is what can sense of place do? Right? Where are the wheels there so we can figure out what the opportunities are, where the potential is, and recognize that it's not really accounted for. Like it, there's no part of the federal scheme that allows for this to have a role. And that's part of it. Right? It's not replacing, but recognizing that there's space. Well, I, we, we're kind of out of time, but, and I'm going to just end with a very uh, a, a question that's intended to incite rather than resolve, <laughs> um, but which is uh, the, the role of, in thinking about values and, and the fact that in a democracy that exists both at community, you know, sta local, state, and federal levels, that part of the discussion and dialogue has to do with values. And, you know, when you discussed the Euclidean zoning, it, it what popped into my mind immediately is that one of the one of the downsides of Euclidean zoning has been the empowerment of communities to engage in racial um, discrimination, and that there's there's some that seems like an element that that this as you engage in this dialogue that you you should be prepared to address. Not not race in and of itself, but the issue right. of values. Exclusionary zoning, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Well, there wasn't a question, I, I thought, though, was it? Well, oh, so, so the incitement was actually an invitation for incitement. I thought it was just to put it out there and, and let it be. Um, no, go ahead. Go ahead. You can go first. Well, go first on this one. So the, I, and, and this is a, a great idea, right? I mean, the really unfortunate part of Euclid was a lot of the historical aspects, sort of the contextual aspect about the, that maybe Euclidean zoning was really intended to exclude Let's partition off particular races, aspects of population. And at the district court level, uh, the federal judge said, this is horrible. Right? You can't use law to exclude like this. Um, by the time it made it to the Supreme Court, they had changed the question. Right? Because the, at that point, uh, the Supreme Court phrased the question as whether local governments have enough power uh, just to defend themselves at all. And there wasn't a lot of specificity as to what that power was. So, the dilemma here is, again, in making sense of place too normative. Right? The idea is not to say, you define yourself this way, and therefore everybody else be damned. It doesn't matter what they think. Right? It, again, it, it, it occurs within a context. This is why we think that competition among local governments becomes a different question when you think about sense of place regulation. Because every neighborhood defining its sense of place is relative to its close neighborhoods, its neighbors. Right? It's regionally specific. It's state specific. 
right? But it's specific and unique to a place. But what that also means is that there's other contextual elements to it. So civil rights are part of it. So every aspect that have to be uniform values are part of it too. It's why we're not replacing federal environmental law. And civil rights would work every other aspect that would contain, and probably the system to make sure that we're avoiding these kinds of harms that come out of discrimination and some such things, would, re would you know, re have some kind of top-down effort that at least defines the confines and boundaries about what you're allowed to do when you define yourself. I mean, unless there's a better way to do it. But, but the idea still is, is that sense of place is contextual. And that context can be broad, right? Um, and it has many facets to it. Um, and it's not isolated, which would allow the villagers of Euclid to do that. Well, thanks. This was really impressive. Thank you so much for your, your time. Thank you for Thank you. coming. Thank you.